Now, do you know what a steward is? If you have an owner of an estate, he'll take one of his servants and he'll make him the steward over his household. He's to be over the house. He's to give other servants and children in the house the provision that the owner has provided for him to give to them. Moses was God's steward. He was God's steward. And all God's saints are stewards of God's grace. The pastor is a steward to the brethren that Christ has entrusted to him to minister to. Older believers are stewards to younger believers. Husbands to wives and children. Fathers and mothers to their children. Elder siblings are stewards to the younger siblings. Peter said, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Paul said, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And that's what we see in Moses in our text. We learn what it is to be a faithful steward of the manifold grace of God. But even as we look at Moses here, being faithful in his stewardship, remember, our righteousness, the perfection even of our stewardship, is not by our faithfulness, but it's by Christ who is the preeminent steward. The Hebrew writer said, Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ as a son to uh, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence in Christ to the end. Christ is the preeminent steward. In all things, Christ has the preeminence. And He's our righteousness even in our stewardship. Now our text here is Exodus 18, and Moses and the children of Israel have come to Rephidim at the Mount of God. I believe in this text, Moses has actually already received the law of God even though that comes in chapter after this. But the text begins here with Moses' father-in-law bringing Moses' wife and his two sons back to him. We read here in verse 1, When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, after Moses had sent her back to Jethro. Jethro brings her to Moses and her two sons. Now first of all, a faithful steward must part with anything that will hinder us from the work God has given us. We must part with anything that will hinder us. This is saying that Moses, uh, Jethro's bringing Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back to Jethro. You remember back in Exodus 4, Moses had not circumcised one of his sons. And God was going to kill Moses because of that. Because he had not done that. And Moses submitted to God. And Zipporah was required to do the work. She was required to circumcise her son but she was not happy about it. She was angry with Moses about it. And seeing that she was going to be a hindrance to him in the work he had to do in Egypt, temporarily Moses sent Zipporah and his sons back to live with her father-in-law. And then Moses went on to Egypt. And that shows us, brethren, if we would be faithful stewards to God, we must part with anything that's going to hinder us in worshiping and serving our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why a believer never wants to marry an unbeliever because it will be a hindrance to you in worshiping and serving the Lord. But, there's, but Moses' wife and his son shows us this applies to anything, even that which is dearest to us. We have to part with it. We have to set it aside even if it's temporarily, so that it doesn't prevent us from doing this work God's given us, whatever it is. Now, as faithful as Moses was in this, 
Christ, the Son of God, was his righteousness in parting with that which hindered. He was his righteousness. Christ Jesus, Philippians 2 tells us, he laid aside his glory. And his power as the Son of God, and he took flesh, he took the form of a servant. He made himself of no reputation, and he came forth doing the will of God. And when he was preaching, you remember one, on one occasion he's preaching, and they came to him and they said, Behold, they said, your mother and your brethren are outside. They want to talk to you. Did he let that hinder the work he was doing? Did he stop preaching and go outside to talk to his mother and father? No, he stretched forth his hands to those to whom he ministered. And he said, Behold, my mother and my father, my sister and my brethren, those that do the will of God, those are my brethren. But he let nothing hinder him from this work. Christ is our perfection, even in letting nothing hinder us from worship and service to God. And God honors those that honor Him. We see that here in that a year later, God brought Moses' wife and his children back to Moses. It had been over a year, and He brings them back to Moses. And it pictures how that Christ honors His faithful stewards. As we... As we let nothing hinder us in, in preaching and promoting and sending forth the gospel of Christ. This shows us a picture of how Christ honors that faithfulness. He draws His people and brings them under the sound of the gospel to hear what Christ has done for us. It says in verse 1, it says, When Jethro heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel His people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then He came. He came. And that's a, that's a picture. God uses faithful stewards that He's made faithful to bring His lost elect under the gospel to hear what Christ has done for His people, how He's delivered His people out of bondage. And those Christ that, rec that He reconciled by His blood are brought to Him, just like Moses' bride and His children were brought to Him. Christ's bride and His children are brought to Him. We see it here in their names. Zipporah here was a Midianite. That means she was an Ethiopian. Now listen to this description of her. She was black. She was sinful. She was a heathen from a cursed race. That's every one of us who God saves by His grace. Gershom was the name of one of the sons. His name means a stranger in a strange land. That's what God makes us to be by His grace when He gives us faith in Christ. He makes us strangers in this land, in this world. And the last son there, or the second son's name was uh, Eli, Eliezer, Eliezer. And that means God is my help, my salvation. And that's where God brings us. He brings us to, to declare God is my salvation. So in that we see the Lord God said, I will honor them that honor me, and I will lightly esteem them that lightly esteem me. And so we see here, he honored that faithfulness that he put in Moses, and he honors his stewards. And we part with whatever hinders us. Now secondly, faithful stewards must give God all the glory in salvation in the gospel we preach and promote. God has to have all the glory. He has, it's His works we're declaring. That's what the gospel is. The declaration of His works. Today I'm, I'm declaring to you a work, a true work of righteousness that God brings His children to do in being faithful stewards. But as I'm declaring that to you, that's really not my message. My main message is the works of our Lord and what He's done to redeem us. Look here in verse 8. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done. He told him all that the Lord had done. He didn't tell him what he had done. Moses didn't say, this is what I've done. He told him all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all the travail that had come upon them by the way and how the Lord delivered them. Don't you know that was a good meeting? Moses sat down that night after they ate supper and, and Moses began to declare everything the Lord had done. He told 
He told Jethro how that the Lord had provided a Passover lamb for all the firstborn in Israel. He didn't provide that firstborn lamb for the Egyptians. He provided the firstborn lamb for those in Egypt. And that lamb died in their place. That's a picture of Christ, our Passover, who was sacrificed for His people. And when God saw the blood on the, do on the, on the door frame, He passed over. And that's when God sees the blood upon His children. There is therefore now no condemnation of them who believe on Christ. Moses declared how that, that God enriched them by giving the Egyptians a heart just to give them their riches when they left out of Egypt. And that's our message. We must declare how that God has enriched us with the unsearchable riches of Christ in making Christ our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. That's all you need. That's everything we need. We need wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. God's enriched us with the unsearchable riches of Christ. We have it all in Christ. God, I mean, uh, Moses told him how that God brought them to the Red Sea and destroyed all their enemies in the Red Sea and brought them to the other side to sing songs of redemption. That's our message. How that all Christ's people were baptized. We were immersed in the Red Sea of Christ's blood when He was immersed under the judgment of God. And by that, Christ destroyed all our enemies and brought us to sing songs of redemption, giving Him the glory. Moses told them how they went to Marah, and the waters were bitter, and how the Lord provided the tree that, that made the water sweet. He preached Jehovah Rapha to him, the Lord that healeth thee. That's our message. Christ has taken that bitter cup of the fury of God's wrath out of our hand, and He's given us that sweet cup. Of, of wine whereby we remember Christ's blood that redeemed us. He declared to him how that God provided manna from heaven and how that he gave them Sabbath rest. And that's what we declare. We declare how God sent his son who is the bread from heaven and how God in him has given us he rest. Christ is our Sabbath. We rest from all our works in Christ. And then he, he preached to them he declared to him how that God provided water from the smitten rock by whose stripes, Christ, by whose stripes we're born again by the Holy Spirit. That's what the water picture. From Christ the smitten rock comes the water, the Holy Spirit, whereby we have life. He declared to him how that Amalek came and attacked him and how that God provided an overthrow of Amalek for him. And that's our message. We preach Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Christ is exalted as Moses held up that rod on the hill. And when Christ is exalted in our hearts, in the gospel, at the right hand of God, when He's exalted, He overthrows our sinful nature and makes us triumphant. But even when He's preaching, even when Moses is declaring everything the Lord had done, giving God all the glory in his preaching, Moses isn't depending on his preaching to make him righteous. Moses' righteousness, even in declaring the works of God, is Christ Jesus, the preeminent steward, the preeminent prophet of God. I don't look to my preaching to make me righteous or make me accepted with God. There's, there's my sin mars even preaching. Christ is my righteousness who, who preached perfectly. Christ came forth and He said, My doctrine's not mine, it's His that sent me. And He preached the Word of God and He did it faithfully, brethren. Now, Jethro was not saved. He, God didn't save Jethro. He went back to his idol gods when this was all over with. But we see how God honors faithful stewardship by bringing our hearers to rejoice in Christ. Verse 9 says, Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 11, he said, Now I know the Lord's greater than all gods. And he brought some offerings, and he sat down in fellowship with God's people. We declare God's wonderful works, and Christ honors 
faithfulness. He, he brings his people to rejoice in the Lord, to rejoice in his works. He brings them to exalt him alone. He brings us to come to him by faith with nothing but Christ pictured in those sacrifices and offerings that Jethro offered. And he gives us sweet fellowship with our brethren. This is what he does to those to whom we preach, who hears the message. So when we speak, we're not going to speak with excellency of speech and of wisdom. We're not going to, we're not going to try to impress people with our knowledge and our wisdom, and we're not going to try to talk over their heads. We're going to make the message clear, and we're going to preach only Christ and Him crucified. We have to declare the wonderful works of God. We must. Thirdly here, we see that a faithful steward, as a faithful steward, we give ourselves completely to whatever God puts in our hand to do. Whatever it is, big or small, that God gives you to do in His kingdom, give yourself to it with everything you have. He says here, in, uh, in verse 13, now remember this, Moses has not seen his wife and children in over a year. But look where he is the very next morning. Verse 13, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people and the stu people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. You would think that Moses would have taken a few days off to spend with his wife. He hadn't seen her in over a year, and his children, and his father-in-law, but he didn't do that. Next morning, he's right back doing what God gave him to do. Now, this is very timely for me. Right? The Lord is, his timeliness is an amazing thing, and his, this is very timely. I'm preparing this message this week, and sat down Monday morning, started working on this, and just about prepared the whole message Monday. And my father-in-law came to see me this weekend. And, and Cynthia, my sister-in-law, and my niece and my nephew, and, and my mother-in-law. And we have a tendency, we're prone to think that when friends come to town, family comes to town, we're prone to think, what will they think of me unless I take off work and spend some time with them or miss services and spend time with them, what would they think of me? You know what we ought to say is, what will they think of my God if I do? I remember not long after Chris Cunningham came to Franklin uh, as our pastor, he told me this story about his brother one time wanted him to go camping. And Chris taught the Bible class under Brother Jack Shanks, pastor at New Canaan then. And um, Chris went to Brother Jack and he asked him, he said, oh, you know, my brother wants me to go camping. And he said, I think if I went with him, maybe I could talk to him, bear witness of Christ to him. It would be a good opportunity. Jack said, you really want to bear witness to him? And he said, be here Sunday morning and preach this Bible class and you'll bear witness to him. That's how we bear witness of Christ, brethren. Let nothing interfere with the worship and service of Christ. But even if you, if you do this to the best of your ability, you're not going to be made righteous by this. Christ is our perfect righteousness in this also. You remember when Joseph and Mary came and they found Christ in the temple and he was there. He was teaching those scholars, those old fellows that were scholars in, in Israel. And he's in there as a child teaching them. And when Moses and Joseph come to him, these are his earthly parents. What did he tell them? I must be about my father's business. I must be about my father's business. Christ is our righteousness even in giving ourselves to the work God's given us to do. He's the perfect, faithful, righteous servant of God. Now lastly, faithful stewards must never use carnal principles. We must never listen to carnal counsel, and we must never use carnal, fleshly principles to determine anything we're going to do in spiritual matters. Never. 
And it says here in verse 14, this was Moses' one mistake, or one of his mistakes. Verse 14, it says, When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. Now listen to that. The people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and His laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. And his father-in-law began to tell him what he needed to do. And he basically told him to set up a court system like what we have in our country. There would be, you know, people who are judges of a great many people who take the lesser matters and then from there they go to district court where there's only a, a little few fewer judges and they judge the people that come to them. And, and it goes on like that, but only the top, hardest, most difficult matters then come to Moses. Moses would be like the Supreme Court. They come to Moses then. And that sounded reasonable. I mean, according to the flesh, you understand, Moses is sitting there, he's, he's talking to all these people, settling these matters with all these people that are coming to him from morning to evening. And it's taking a lot of time for him and for them because there's so many people. And it just makes carnal sense and it makes good reason in our minds, fleshly speaking, to do what Jethro said. But Jethro's a heathen idolater here. This man does not know God. And he's judging by carnal sight, and he's reasoning by carnal reasoning in what he told Moses. Moses had given God this great honor. He'd given him this great privilege. Moses is leading the one church of God in the whole world at this time. And there's probably around four million people by this time. And Moses, he's given the honor and the privilege to be God's mouthpiece to these people. That's an honor. That's a great privilege he's given. Whatever God's given you to do for his people, brethren, I don't care if it's, if it's just a very small thing that's not even recognized, consider it to be the greatest honor and the greatest privilege because it is. It is. If God gives us anything in His kingdom to do, that's a great honor. That's a great privilege. But in spiritual matters, we must never take the advice of carnal men using carnal reasoning and, and operating under carnal principles. Never. Jethro appealed to Moses' flesh. He said there in verse 18, Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing's too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Well, that would be true if, God people, if God's people did anything by our strength. That would be true. But we can't even... We can't believe by our own strength. We can't persevere in faith by our own strength. We can't establish the law in righteousness by our own strength. There's nothing you and I do by our own strength in spiritual things. Christ promised to be Moses' strength. Go back to Exodus chapter 3 and look at verse 12. This is when Moses is first going, he's being, Christ is speaking to him in the burning bush. Remember this? And God, and uh, Christ is speaking to him here. And uh, Moses said, verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, the Lord wasn't calling Moses to do it. Look at what the Lord says to him. He said, Certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto you that I have sent thee. This is how you're going to know I sent you and I'm with you and I'm doing the work, Christ said. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, 
you shall ser serve God upon this very mountain. You know where Moses is when Jethro gives him the, this advice and Moses takes it? You know where he is? He's in that mount with those people that Christ brought out of Egypt, just like Christ promised. That's where he's standing, in the mount of God. Right there where Christ revealed Himself at the beginning. And He said, I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to bring the children of Israel out. I'm going to bring you to this mount right here. And that's how you're going to know, I'm with you. So, this is what aggravates Moses' mistake here. He should have, he should have seen, this is the promise Christ made to me. I'm standing right here where Christ said He'd bring me. And I'm standing right here with the people Christ said He'd bring out. And that should have... Let Moses know Christ is going to be my strength from here on out. He's going to be my strength to judge these people. He's standing at the very mountain. Christ is the strength of His people. He's the strength of His people. He was Moses' strength. Moses didn't do anything he had done up to this point in his own fleshly strength. Nothing. Christ was his strength to do what he had done. Christ was his strength. And what did Christ say? My strength is made perfect. My strength is manifest in perfection through your weakness. He takes you and I who are, there's not many wise men, not many noble after the flesh. He takes, he takes nobodies. Why, do he, why does He do that? To show that no flesh is going to glory in His presence. But He that glories, we're going to glory in the Lord. He's our strength. Jethro said in verse 19, back in Exodus 18, 19, he said, Hearken now unto my voice, and God will be with you. He was already with him. <laughs> the Lord was already with Moses. And he says, he told, told Moses to choose out these men to judge all these lesser cases, and so that only the hardest cases would be brought to Moses. And look at verse 22. In verse 22, he says, uh, there in the middle, towards the end, he says, Show, So it shall be easier for thyself. He appealed to him on the basis of making it easier for himself. <coughs> Brethren, don't do anything in the kingdom of God. Anything. Don't do anything in the kingdom of God from the carnal principle of, of making it easier on yourself. Nothing. Nothing. When God sent His only begotten Son to die for His people, did God make it easy on Himself? When Christ came down from heaven's glory and took flesh and no reputation, so that when we saw Him, we wouldn't see anything carnally that we would desire in Him, so that we would know this is all of God's grace. And when He bore the sin of His people, and He bore the fury of God's strict, unbending justice, so that God could be declared just and the justifier, and, and, and the righteousness of God would be manifest. When Christ did that, did He make it easier on Himself? We must determine what we should do by the Word of God. We don't even want to judge things by providence. Providence helps you sometimes, but sometimes not. Sometimes not. You remember uh, Elimelech in Ruth, in the book of Ruth, he judged by providence. And so he saw there was a famine in Bethel and that Moab had bread, so he took his family to Moab. And God killed him and his sons. We don't judge by providence. We, we determine what we ought to do by the Word of God. What does God's Word say? We determine what we ought to do by what gives God all the glory. And what is good for His people. And that is in accordance with these other things. What does God's Word say and what gives God the glory? That's how we determine what to do. We don't determine by carnal reason or carnal sense or 
what fleshly speaking makes sense. We don't, we don't, we look at God's word. God's word. You know, from Egypt, from the time the Lord sent Moses to Egypt up to this point right here, as long as Moses depended upon Christ for his strength, he accomplished everything Christ sent him to do. Everything. Nothing was too hard for the Lord. Everything that the Lord sent Moses to accomplish, the Lord being Moses' strength, Moses looking to the Lord alone, he was able to do everything the Lord sent him to do. But the moment he heard Jethro and he started considering himself and he started considering how big this work was, that's when he gave up. That's when he stopped. I heard a woman this week talking. And she said, uh, she was talking about how she married her husband and they married young and things were great. And she said, but about six years in, she said, I began thinking about all the things I wanted to do in life. She began thinking about herself. And she said, and I began thinking about how I won't be able to accomplish those things with this man. And she said, and it became unbearable for me to be married to him any longer. And she left him. She was fine when she wasn't considering herself, when she was when she wasn't considering herself. When she started considering herself, it became too heavy of a burden. Now I can tell you this, brethren, from experience. Any time as a pastor, as a father, I mean as a husband, as a father, as a friend, any time that I have looked, that I have found the burden too heavy, it was always because I was considering myself. Always. Always. Any time I've ever found fault with my wife, it's been because I was thinking of me. And how it wasn't fair. And how it was just selfish. And I guarantee you this, brethren, that's so of you too. I know it is. On another occasion, how do you know this was a mistake by Moses? Because you, you got in Scripture sometimes, and the Lord doesn't tell you in one passage, you can go to another passage and He'll give you some light on it. And in Numbers 11, in verse 11, Moses said to the Lord, He said, why have you, why have I not found favor in your sight? Can you believe Moses said that? Why have I not found favor in thy sight? That thou layest the burden of all this people upon me. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? As Moses was looking at himself at that point. Does God ever tell us to look to ourselves? Is there any time that God said, the only time He says to look to yourself is to examine what God has done for you. But here's what He tells us. Lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And that sin is unbelief from looking at ourselves. Lay it aside and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That's who he tells us to look to. And what do we see when we look to Christ? We see one who endured the cross, who endured despising the shame of the cross. We see one we consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest, he said, when you start considering yourself, you be wearied and faint in your minds. That's what he's telling them. And he said, if you do consider yourself, he said, consider this, you have not resisted unto blood striving against sin. What he's telling us, brethren, is when the load gets heavy, look to the cross. 
it'll lighten. It will lighten. Whatever you're doing, whatever it is, in any capacity, in spiritual, being, being a, a steward of God, and the burden gets heavy to you as a, as a pastor, as a husband, as a, as a wife, as a mother, father, sister, brother, whatever, look to the cross. That burden will lighten on you. It'll get a whole lot lighter. We have, it's, our, our burden is called a light affliction. It's just for a moment. Philippians 4.13, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Where was he when he said that? He's in prison for preaching the gospel of Christ. And he said, and most all of my brethren have forsaken me. And he said, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. He said in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We're just clay pots in which the Lord has put this treasure in. This treasure of the gospel, this treasure of sending forth this gospel in the world and preaching this gospel. Why did God give this treasure in these earthen vessels? that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's why. So he gets all the glory. That's why he's chosen these foolish things, me and you, that he might get all the glory. So we're not to look to ourselves and we're not to think that the Lord's laid all this burden on me for me to carry it. He's carrying you and the burden. <laughs> we look to him. And the burden comes, becomes light. If we don't want to honor God, we don't, or we don't want the honor God has given us, and whatever it is He's given us to do, if we don't want the honor in it, God will give that honor to somebody else. In Numbers 11, after Moses complained, that's where the Lord told Moses, you choose 70 men. Choose out 70 men. And the Lord said, I'll take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and I'll put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. What's he teaching us there? God does not need us. <laughs> he doesn't need us. If there's some, some little thing that God's put in my hand, and, and I don't want that honor, and I don't want that privilege, and I think it's too heavy a burden for me, I'm not going to stop that work from being carried out. God's just going to give it to somebody else to do it and take the honor away from me. That's all that's going to happen. Our unfaithfulness will do this, though. It'll cause us to go backwards in unbelief. That's what happened to Moses in Numbers eleven twenty one. 21. Moses said, now this is what he said here. After all of that, after the Lord said, I'm going to take the Spirit off of you, and I'm not, I'm not giving more of the Spirit, I'm just taking some from you and giving it to these other men. And after that, listen to what Moses says. Moses said, the people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen. That's just the footmen. If you consider 600,000 and they had wives and they had children, you know, you're talking millions of people now. But he said, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh that they may eat a whole month. Moses says, shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? And the Lord rebuked Moses. The Lord rebuked him. And the Lord said, is the Lord's hand waxed short? And this is after he'd done all that work in Egypt and brought them through that wilderness where the, to where they had come. He says, you think my hand now all of a sudden has waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And then by making these men judges, you know what Moses did? This is where that problem with Korah started right there. It was a mistake. Christ is our righteousness in this too, brethren. He told his apostles, he's about to go to the cross, and he said, uh, he told him he's fixed to go to the cross. Peter rebuked him. 
Remember that? Peter said, Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Now just think if our Lord had taken that carnal counsel according to carnal reason. He wouldn't have went to the cross. But what did our Lord do? He said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You see, it's Christ's perfect faithfulness to God by which we're made righteous. That's why in the New Testament, God doesn't mention any of this about Moses. Any of this unbelief and this unfaithfulness, He don't mention it at all because under the covenant of grace, robed in the righteousness of Christ and His perfect faithfulness, brethren, He said Moses was faithful in all his house. <laughs> Moses never did anything unfaithful. Because our righteousness, our faithfulness, our perfection before God is Christ, it's not us. So even in our stewardship, He gets the glory. So understand this, it's a privilege that God allows us to do anything for Him. Paul said, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. <laughs> that shows you what a privilege allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. And he said, even as, as the Lord did that for us, so we preach the gospel. We speak not pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. And by Christ's love for us, as our constraint, by, by beholding His faithfulness, His righteousness, what He's done for us, being constrained and motivated in our heart by His love for us, brethren, let us be faithful stewards. One, by setting aside any hindrance. Two, by only promoting the message that gives God all the glory in salvation. Three, by giving ourselves completely to whatever God has put in our hands to do. And fourthly, by never doing anything by carnal principles and carnal reason, but only by looking to Christ our strength. That's a faithful steward. Amen. Let's stand together. I, uh, I didn't say this at the beginning because I didn't want to point you to the clock, but I prepared this message as, to be the main message. And uh, then I remembered this is the first Sunday. And I wanted to preach uh, out of Romans for that. So the next message is probably a little shorter. But anyhow, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this word. I pray, Lord, you really and truly would make us faithful stewards and consider the honor you give us to do anything in your name. Lord, make us look only always to Christ our strength, to Christ our righteousness, and trust that he is the one who's holding us up, who's going to not let us fall, who's going to make us faithful, and who's going to bring us into your presence accepted. Let us not look to ourselves, to any of this work you've given us, any of this privilege. Let us never look to it, thinking this is how we're going to be saved. But let us do it looking to Christ, who is our Savior, our righteousness, our all. Lord, we ask these things in his precious name. Amen.